hello and welcome to our webinar on perennial grains with Aaron Daly, PhD candidate from the University of Alberta. Um, for those of you that have never attended one of our events, uh, Rural Roots to Climate Solutions is an Alberta-based project out of the Settler Learning Centre. Uh, we host workshops, field days, and webinars across the province, empowering rural Albertans with climate solutions. So we work with farmers and producers to create a space for discussions to happen about climate solutions, and we advocate that climate solutions can also be farm solutions. So our Perennial Grains webinar today is actually part two of a webinar series that we are co-hosting with Resilient Rurals. Part one of our webinar series was two weeks ago, and we talked about intercropping with Dr. Eric Bremer from Western Ag Innovation. Um, if you missed it, you can find a recording of it on our YouTube channel. And before I hand things over to Erin, both of these webinars were actually meant to be part of our uh, Building Resilient Farms workshop in Bruderheim, Alberta. Um, unfortunately, this had to be cancelled because of COVID-19. Um, and while COVID has definitely made things challenging for us, um, it has not made things impossible. Um, so we're really happy to be offering the content online today instead. Um, so like I said, uh, we have partnered with um, Resilient Rurals on this webinar. So just before I hand things over to Erin, I will let Jill from Resilient Rurals say a few words about their organization. So Jill, if you just want to make sure that you're unmuted, um, I will hand things over to you. Thank you so much, Marie. Um, so like you mentioned, my name is Jill and I'm with Resilient Rural. Uh, we're a partnership between the towns of Bruderheim, Gibbons and Lamont in Alberta's industrial heartland area. And we're working together towards a regional climate change adaptation and resilience plan. We've got a really strong resilience focus. We are looking at the climate change piece, but we're kind of taking a different, more holistic approach and, and looking at the different factors that impact municipalities and our ability to be uh, responsive and resilient. Um, and we are also taking an approach to finding out what that small town lens to that adaptation piece is as well. Um, I just want to make note that we have a agricultural producer survey on our website. So if you go to resilientrural.com, um that's there and, and uh, we're trying to capture some information that isn't necessarily captured um, in other ways and we will be providing that information to other levels of government as well so um on behalf of our community thank you so much to rural roots for climate solutions team you guys do great work and we're super excited to hear from Aaron daily so thank you so much for taking the time today to do this yeah, thank you jill um, so, yeah, it would have been great if we were able to meet in person for the workshop, but this is the next best thing. Uh, so once Erin gets going, I'll put the Resilient Rural's uh, web address into the chat box for everyone as well. Um, and I think that, that that is everything from me and that's everything from Jill. So let's start talking about perennial grains. Okay. Uh, I'll hand things over to Erin. All right. Okay. So, hi, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank you so much for listening to my presentation um, on some of the interesting research that myself and as well my colleagues have the opportunity to pursue on perennial cereals at the University of Alberta. So again, my name is Erin Daly. I work um, under Dr. Guillermo Hernandez Ramirez and some of the research I will be presenting is also from my colleague Kimbe Kim. Let's try to get this, okay. So, I think personally that it's really interesting to ask how we got to where we are with modern agriculture today and why annual grains are the majority of crops grown worldwide and, and why it's such a paradigm shift when we talk about perennial cereal grains. So um, quick history lesson, annual crop domestication began in earnest in a place known as the Fertile Crescent. I'm not sure if you can see my, um, my uh, mouse there, but it's just this red area here. And uh, it began around 11,000 years ago in um, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Turkey. It contains three major rivers here, the Nile, the Euphrates, and the Tigris. And what these rivers did is they imparted really fertile soil onto these regions, which allowed for the cultivation of ancient grains like emmer and einkorn wheat, as well as barley, peas, and lentils. So all of our, um, their ancient versions of our modern, a lot of our uh, popular, annual grains. So it's important to realize that 
by choosing to pursue annual agriculture, these societies had to input a lot of effort to combat natural succession and maintain that highly disturbed landscape that's necessary for annual cultivation. So what they did is they used manpower and eventually animal power to maintain these crops and they were reliant on solar energy. Um, solar energy was converted into chemical energy by plants, then consumed by humans and so on and so on, and they were able to maintain this system. Essentially, all the energy was provided by the sun and it was a cyclical um, transfer of energy. But one of the most common questions that arises then is if annual agriculture required so much work, so many inputs, why did they choose it? Um, I think the simplest answer is that annuals produce more seed more quickly. As well, there's some research to show that annual life cycles um, coincide better with these annual migration patterns. So just to look at some of these ancient um, first annual grain varieties that I think is really interesting. I've never seen poulard wheat. I think it's kind of cool looking. Uh, as well, if you're um, into like health foods, this is spelt. It's sort of making a comeback um, as like a, a healthier ancient grain. Just kind of interesting that it is from 11,000 years ago or around then. So I mentioned that by Pursuing annual agriculture, ancient societies had to input a lot of effort to maintain um, like a highly disturbed ecosystem. And, and this image depicts a sort of successional timeline from time one to time six that would happen naturally in an ecosystem from disturbance to full succession. So tillage and things like chem fallow imitate the ecosystem depicted here in space one which is highly disturbed and lacking in native vegetation. So you're fighting against natural succession. This is where annual agriculture resides. Um, now a days, um, annual crops, including cereals and oil seeds and legumes, make up about 80% of global food because of decisions that were made by ancient peoples 11,000 years ago. These crops occupy about 60 to 80% of global croplands, and because of this, native grasslands are among the most endangered of ecosystems. And this is due in large part um, because of their agricultural suitability and therefore widespread conversion to cropland. Studies have shown that conversion back to native grassland has shown improvements in soil physical quality in very short time scales. So transition back to a perennial system has the potential to repair some of the adverse effects that we see with annual cropping that I'll discuss, discuss in a moment. But obviously returning all of our cropland to perennial grassland is not realistic. Um, sustaining and increasing food production for a population that's expected to surpass 11 billion people by 2100 um, creates a really complex challenge for existing production techniques. Um, however, long-term food security, I, I do believe can be achieved through the implementation of more sustainable agricultural methods. Um, it's not all bad. Yields of annual grain crops have doubled since the 1950s, which is amazing to think about that we've doubled yields in, in 70 years. However, the demand is still continuing to increase. Um, and there's still lots of food insecure places in the world and, and population is growing. Um, but remember that I mentioned that the earliest farmers were reliant on solar energy. We've since transitioned um, from a reliance on solar energy to a reliance on fossil fuels. And in a lot of cases with respect to agriculture, this is really inefficient. Um, in some cases, it can take up to four calories of fossil fuels to make one calorie of food. Um, so since I mentioned earlier that I'm a super soil nerd, I had to throw in a definition somewhere that really hits home as to the essential functioning of soil for literally everything. Um, Soil is a natural body at the atmosphere lithosphere interface. It's a dynamic entity teeming with life. It's essential to recycling dead and decaying organic matter, storing of nutrients, denaturing of pollutants, filtering of water, sequestering of carbon, and it's a medium for plant growth and it literally supports all terrestrial life. So like its importance can't be understated. Overstated? Yes, that's the word. There you go. So with regards to soil quality, um, soil quality can be used um, by some interchangeably with soil health. You might hear both. Um, soil quality encompasses the physical, biological, and chemical aspects that allow a soil to perform the function for which it's allotted. 
Soil degradation reduces agronomic productivity and it's a major constraint to production that we face today. Um, the rate of productivity growth has declined actually from about 2% per year during the Green Revolution after the advent of nitrogen fertilizers to about 1% today. So we're seeing a decline in our productivity advances despite advances in technology. Soil degradation also leads to a reduction in ecosystem goods and services. So ecosystem goods and services provided by soils include um, habitat provision, water filtration, cycling of nutrients, sequestration of carbon. Uh, it's incredibly important to note here that soil is a non-renewable resource on the timelines that we need it. So I say that because um, it's currently being eroded at a much greater rate that it's being formed. So it is naturally formed. So it is technically renewable, but it's being um, eroded much faster. I, soil formation rates are about a half a ton per hectare per year, whereas erosion rates are a hundred to a thousand times higher than that currently. So some of the issues with modern agricultural production include erosion, compaction, loss of soil organic carbon, reduced fertility, acidification, and salinization. And all of these are reducing your ability to produce, and they're also harming your ecosystem goods and services. So when I talk about soil quality, we encompass all these aspects within the overarching ideal, uh, idea of quality. So physical quality, chemical quality, and biological quality. Soil physical quality includes um, the soil structure and how well it's able to hold and transport air and water through its matrix as well as how well roots are able to penetrate its matrix. When I talk about chemical quality, it refers to things like a soil's cation exchange capacity, um, its buffering capacity, ability to retain nutrients and its pH. And biological quality is soil's organic matter content, microbial community function and diversity, which we're coming to realize the microbial biomass and the function of your soil is a huge um, portion of your soil's ability to function and your, um, um, your ability to produce. So all of these components can and are threatened by unsustainable farming practices that are occurring today. So what are perennial cereal grains and what do they have to do with what I've been going on about for the last 10 minutes? Um, perennial cereal grains are perennial cultivars of annual grain crops. They've only recently been under development by researchers, so not a lot is known, is known yet about their survivability or suitability to different climates. Like you have to think that these perennial cereals have a long way to come yet. We've been, we've been researching them for 50 years, whereas annual grains have been cultivated for 11,000 years. So they're really promising, but there's still some research questions. Um, they're characterized by low soil disturbance and stand persistence as they're seeded in one year and they grow for several seasons. Similar to like a wild progeny, they may have increased root mass compared to an annual. And we know that increases in root mass show beneficial impacts on your soil physical and biological and chemical qualities. Importantly, they have a greater synchrony with nutrient and water availability. So compared to an annual crop, they're able to begin growing at the very beginning of the growing season. So in this part of the world, that's spring, uh, lots of water in the soil, lots of nutrients, and they're able to use that spring moisture and those nutrients that would otherwise be wasted in an annual system that hadn't even been seeded yet. They provide ecosystem services by providing year-round habitat and protection of soil from erosion. They harbor more diverse microbial communities for a couple reasons. Um, they may have the potential to reduce nitrous oxide emissions and this is sort of my research focus so I'll discuss more on that in a moment. Some perennial crops that are currently being developed include wheat, rye, which is what uh, my research deals with today, rye, um, rice, sorghum, wheatgrass, wheatgrass, um, you can see in brackets there, there's uh, Kernza. Kernza is actually one of the first commercially available perennial cultivars of a crop. It's um, developed by the Land Institute in Kansas as well as silphium. And silphium is an oil seed that I believe is related to sunflowers. Um, so quickly, there are two methods that scientists are currently using to develop these crops. So domestication, whereas, uh, whereby a wild perennial is 
bred for specific traits and domesticated over several generations, or perennialization. And this involves crossing annuals with perennial relatives and then selecting for perennial traits in their offspring. So this is, these are both images of Kernza left and right. This again was developed at the Land Institute in Kansas. You can see on this right, this is on the right hand side, an image of a two, the second year of a Kernza crop. And this is a one year of an annual wheat. And you can just imagine that the um, differential impacts of that rooting mass would have on your soil physical quality as well as your chemical. So I showed this graphic earlier and I explained how these components contributed to overall soil quality and how I mentioned that agricultural practices had the potential to threaten all three categories simultaneously. Now I, I'd like to use this graphic to show just some of the main ways that we hypothesize perennial grain cropping systems could improve soil physical quality, chemical quality, and biological quality. So with respect to physical quality, we see reduced tillage, increased root mass, and persistent cover that are going to combat some of those issues related to erosion and loss of topsoil, um, as well as compaction and loss of soil structure. Chemical quality can be improved by increased nutrient input um, via more litter inputs, as well as the potential for reduced fertilizer inputs. I mentioned that they are uh, more in sync with the availability of water and nutrients, and, and that might allow us to use less fertilizer in these systems, and that's a question that we still need to examine. Um, biologically, a perennial system has been shown to increase organic matter inputs, as, including root exudate, and reduce disturbance at the same time, and, and what that does is it harbors a healthier, more resilient microbial community. Essentially, with perennial grains, the idea is to emulate some of the qualities of a functioning perennial grass ecosystem. And these ecosystems have functioned on landscapes for, for many, many years, and we don't see declines in productivity or soil quality. So we want to emulate that efficiency as a whole system as opposed to annual cropping systems. So some of my research questions, um, I mentioned that I'm using a, a perennial rye that was developed in Lethbridge, Alberta. It's known as ACE1 perennial cereal rye. Um, some of the questions that my research aims to answer include, does ACE1 PC rye have increased root mass versus a comparable annual? Because we know that root mass imparts all those beneficial qualities. Does ACE1 PC rye improve soil physical quality? And that's in part due to that increased root mass, perhaps reduced tillage, reduced compaction. Does ACE1 PC rye increase soil particulate organic matter? So are we gonna see increases in organic carbon in that soil? Does ACE1 PC rye reduce nitrous oxide emissions or N2O emissions? And does it produce comparable yields to an annual? Because um, of course this is a fundamental concern is profitability is going to drive choices by producers. So we set out to answer these questions using a field trial set up in two locations in Alberta with different climactic and soil conditions. And the, we have field trials in Edmonton as well as Breton, Alberta. So quickly, the field trial was a randomized complete block design where we set up a sort of um, continuum of perenniality. So there's nine treatments and four blocks total. Um, within each block, there's a fallow plot, a chem fallow plot where nothing was growing. Annual rye or spring rye, I tend to use those terms interchangeably. So I'll say annual rye, seeded in the spring, harvested that fall. Uh, fall rye, so we call that a biennial. It's sort of in between. It's seeded in the fall. It grows over, well, it goes dormant over winter, and then it's harvested the next fall. Perennial rye and a native grass mix plot to really emulate that natural pr prairie system. What this does is it allows us to compare how the perennial grain is impacting the soil compared to an annual cultivar, like a spring rye, uh, versus a true perennial grass mix stand here. We also duplicated each treatment, save for the fallow, within each block so that we could test the effects of nitrogen fertilizer as well. So for this, we use a urea ESN blend in a ratio of two to one. And um, also at the Breton site, this is just um, 
my favorite part. We had a little bit more room, so we were able to establish two four hectare plots seeded to just perennial rye and just annual rye for that contrast. And for that, we are able to do some larger greenhouse gas flux measurements on those. Um, so one of our research questions I mentioned is that if perennial grains have a greater root mass than a comparable annual cultivar. So here's a, a perennial stand here. And this is because root mass imparts a lot of benefits onto the soil, including structurally and by way of additions of organic carbon. And to test this question, we completed root sampling during the 2018 and 2019 growing season. And we'll do it again this year as well. So we use this um, truck mounted auger and we get all of these cores and then all of our summer interns get to wash the soil away from the cores and isolate the root mass and dry and weigh all the root mass. They love doing it. <laughs> I've included here some of the findings from that 2018 and 2019 field season at the Edmonton site. So each of these graphs represents a different year. So here's 2018 on the right is 2019 here. This y-axis is the root density, essentially. The x-axis, we split our profile depths into three, um, three blocks. And then the orange will be your spring mass, fall is the blue, and then this teal is the perennial. So as you can see in 2018, at each sampling depth, the perennial, which is the teal bar, had significantly greater root mass than the annual, which is the orange bar, at each sampling depth. And in fact, even at that 30 to 60, it had significantly greater root mass than the fall as well. Um, similarly, in 2019, you see again that the perennial had significantly greater root mass than the annual crop at the 15 to 30, as well as the 30 to 60 centimeter depth. And um, the only reason that this 0 to 15 is not significantly greater statistically is because we had one outlier um, of the root mass, but there was numerically much greater root mass in that perennial than the spring crop throughout both years at this site. So when I talk about soil physical quality, um, and there's lots of components to it, but how do we measure that? We're using a methodology called high prop. So a high prop core is this silver core right here. And we take that as an intact sample in the field. So we take these silver cores, we hammer them into the soil at different depths, and we bring them back to the lab where we hook them up to this computer. And that computer runs a program which allows us to measure their porosity, soil water retention curves, unsaturated hydraulic conductivity, as well as bulk density. So it's, it's a really amazing program that we can gather all of this information from intact soil cores. Um, essentially using this method, we gather information about the pore network of the soils, as well as how well that soil can move and hold air and water. And these are key components of soil physical quality. Um, and because that takes a little bit of time to manifest, we conducted an initial high prop sampling in our first field year, and we're going to use that as a baseline. We have to conduct another one this year after three years of perennial growth, and that will be used to discern any differences between the treatments and see if our hypotheses are correct with regards to the perennial improving these, um, uh, these qualities in the soil. So I mentioned about organic carbon. And so what we measured is called POM, and that stands for particulate organic matter. Particulate organic matter is a really important component of your soil organic matter because it's highly labile and it's a, it's a source of energy for microbes. It's, it's rapidly cycled through the soil and therefore it's capable of showing treatment effects within realistic timescales for a short-term field study. Because when we talk about soil carbon stocks, soil nitrogen stocks, um, they don't respond immediately to uh, differences in like, you'll see legacy effects of soil carbon from years of hay cropping in an annual crop and vice versa. You'll see legacy effects of poor soil carbon, even when you're trying to improve your soil carbon stocks. It is a slow process, but what we can do is measure this thing called POM. It's one fraction of the total soil organic matter. So we use it as an indicator for these reasons. And my colleague Kumbe Kim conducted palm sampling in 2018 and 2019 at both of our Edmonton and Breton sites for all of our um, perennial, annual, fall, and fallow plots. 
And these are some of his findings. This is data just from the 2018 sampling at the Breton site. Um, the top is from the zero to 7.5 soil interval. The bottom graph is here is from 7.5 to 15. The y-axis here is your palm concentration. And the x-axis is showing you all of our different treatments. So focusing on this zero to 7.5, the main takeaway from this graph is that the perennial grain was inputting the same amount of palm into the soil as the perennial grass mix. So that, um, that prairie that we tried to emulate. So they're both pink, meaning that there's no significant difference between these two treatment effects. As well, both of these treatments were significantly different than this fallow plot. So the fallow plot with nothing growing on it had the lowest palm and only the perennial and the grass mix had significantly greater palm that we could measure and quantify. Fall, spring did not have significantly different palm levels compared to the fallow. At the 7.5 to 15 centimeter depth interval, this treatment effect held only for the perennial plot. So at this depth, only the perennial grain had greater palm than the fallow plot. The grass mix was not discernible from the fallow anymore. So based on these results, the perennial grain is inputting the same amount or more palm into your soil than a grassland system, which is really promising. So I, I told you I was gonna talk about it. It's my favorite um, topic, but I will talk about how it affects you as well um, economically, and that's really important to a lot of producers, I understand as well. So how do perennial grains impact greenhouse gases? Agriculture is a significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, anthropogenically, it is in some sec um, for some greenhouse gases, it is the single greatest emitter of greenhouse gases. Um, however, Perennial cropping systems have reduced tillage and therefore reduced organic matter mineralization because um, that, that soil stays protected and therefore it increases soil carbon sequestration and thus it has the potential to reduce CO2 emissions from the soil. Importantly, they have also been hypothesized to reduce N2O and this is the greenhouse gas that I was saying that agriculture is the main contributor to nitrous oxide emissions worldwide. Um, Nitrous oxide is really important because it's actually a greenhouse gas that's 298 times more efficient at global warming than CO2 on a mass basis. And it also reacts, it's also degrades stratospheric ozone. So N2O is like very scary. Um, because perennials improve soil structure and they can reduce water logging and increase their uptake of water and nutrients during spring thaw, they have the potential to reduce N2O. And I'll explain a little bit more about this because I think um, it's really important to understand the processes behind these uh, greenhouse gas emissions so we can really start to understand how to mitigate these things. So I mentioned that um, N2O has a global warming potential much, much higher, almost 300 times higher than CO2. It destroys stratospheric ozone. And the increases in nitrous oxide emissions are largely due to human alteration of this global nitrogen cycle. So nitrous oxide is formed via natural processes in the soil, but what we've done is essentially fed it. So nitrous oxide is formed via nitrification and denitrification. Nitrification is the oxidation of ammonium. So when we apply fertilizer, this fertilizer is oxidized to nitrate in the soil naturally by microbial processes. This um, intermediate product here can break down naturally and, and release some N2O. It's generally not the main contributor though. And when I talk about the main contributor, I mean denitrification. So denitrification occurs when the soil is wet and it has ample nitrate. So you can see this here starts from nitrate and goes to the inert gas N2. Um, what happens is when soil moisture is high and there's ample nitrogen in the soil, we essentially feed these denitrifying micro, microorganisms and we see a lot of N2O released as a byproduct. By reducing soil moisture and nitrogen and potentially ameliorating some of the compaction and poor connectivity issues, Perennial grain crops can reduce N2O compared to annual crops. Also, I mentioned it's really important to note that while there's significant environmental costs associated with N2O release, it also represents um, a huge economic loss for producers. The source of that N2O is 
the fertilizer that you've put into the soil largely. And once it becomes N2O, it's not available for plant uptake. So it's wasted fertilizer, wasted money, and minimizing this waste should be a priority both for environmental and economic reasons. Um, I mentioned what we do know is that the majority of N2O in this part of the world is released during spring thaw when soil temperatures increase above zero and the soil is really wet and there's no crop on that soil to be uptaking that moisture in those nutrients to prevent these emissions. So um, again, wasted environmental costs, whereas in perennial systems, these resources could actually be utilized by the crop. So you're actually um, being more efficient and you're also reducing your environmental costs. So what we did is we set up uh, greenhouse gas emission measurements at our field trial to answer some of these research questions regarding perennials and N2O. You can see in these images, these are um, on the left and the right here, these are collars that we install in the soil. And what we do once or twice a week, is so we place a lid on that collar and we extract the soil gases after about an hour that have built up in that chamber. And we inject it into a glass vial, take that back to the lab, and we monitor or we analyze that using gas chromatography. And that will tell us what the soil is releasing for greenhouse gases. And we can calculate how much is being released by the soil. Also, um, this is just my favorite part of my experiment. I call it my soil laser. It's, um, it's called an FTIR. And what this does is it shoots a laser over the field that's reflected by this mirror here and shoots that laser back to this FTIR or Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscope, hence why soil laser is much easier to say and cooler. Um, and what it does is it tells you how much gas is in the air because it that gas is capable of absorbing certain wavelengths of that laser. And when that laser comes back, certain wavelengths are absorbed and it can tell you how much N2O absorbed those laser wavelengths. Super cool. So that's just some of the research we're able to do to uh, monitor these greenhouse gases coming from soil. So I know this is a really busy graph. There's just a couple of main takeaways that I'd like um, to you to see from this. So, the top is the emission data from our Edmonton site in the 2017-2018 year. The bottom graph is a combination of some important environmental factors that we know influence the magnitude of N2O emissions. So here we have the date. You'll see there's a big gap. We assume that when the soil is frozen and there's a lot of snow cover, those greenhouse gases coming from soil are negligible. This is the N2O flux. And I want you to look down here. These blue crosses represent average soil moisture. So you see a spike in soil moisture right here and that corresponds really well with this spike in greenhouse gases. So this was the spring thaw of that year, end of April, early May, sort of. You also see that the soil temperature and the air temperatures are going above zero. And what we were able to detect, this pink is the, green, uh, the nitrous oxide coming from the fall plots. The green is from the perennial grass mix that we use to emulate a perennial system. And these blue here are our perennial grain crops. So you see that the perennial grain crop sort of comes in between the fall rye and the grass mix. So it is reducing nitrous oxide emissions in this spring thaw relative to a fall crop and that's really important that's what we were looking for and this is just in the first year so the roots still haven't had as much time to develop we did see some treatment effects fertilizer application you see a little bump there precipitation soil moisture goes up a little bit a little bump but this year was pretty tame for nitrous oxide emissions except for that spring thaw pulse again last year here you see the soil moisture skyrocketing again as well as um, it coincides well with the temperature of the soil in the air going above zero. Spring thaw was early April this year at this site. And in this one, actually, this is two years of perennial growth now. The perennial, you see really low nitrous oxide emissions. They do spike a little bit later, but not nearly as high as the annual crop. So once the perennial has been able to establish for about two years, it is using that spring moisture that's available. You can see it here. It's much higher than the rest of the year. It's using that moisture. It's using those nutrients and it's reducing the nitrous oxide pulse from the spring thaw. 
Last year, as we all know, it was really wet. So we did see a lot more water logging and some more events of nitrous oxide emissions. But look again, it's that spring crop that's still exuding the most nitrous oxide in a lot of these precipitation events. We did see a nitrous oxide pulse after we harvested the first forage from the grass mix. And that's, there's really interesting reasons behind that and I can explain it, but later maybe because been talking about nitrous oxide flux for a long time. So <laughs> I'll move on now. Um, there's a lot of conflicting hypotheses regarding a trade-off between perenniality and yield. So currently perennial grains face yield consequences to maintain that perenniality. Can this be bred out of them? Um, this is a current challenge for grain breeders and geneticists. Research has shown though that perennial cereals must provide at least 60% of the annual or of annual yields to be economically viable for producers. So they could also be economically viable if they produced enough forage that made mixed crop and livestock operations able to offset some of those reduced yields as well. Again, there's still so many unknowns, including improvements in breeding and market prices. Are you gonna get the same price for a perennial rye as you would an annual rye, um, as well as the ability of the perennial to maintain that 60% yield over multiple harvests. So here is data from our 2018-2019 Edmonton field trials for the perennial fall and spring rye grain, as well as the straw or biomass, I use those interchangeably, yields. So the green is grain, the orange here is the biomass. Y, excuse me, is kilograms per hectare. And the x-axis here is the treatment. So what you see in 2018, reduced grain yields in the perennial relative to the fall and the spring. However, we were seeing only about a 40 to 50% reduction. So still on that line of economically viable for producers. Um, we did see a significantly reduced harvest index. So harvest index is um, just a, a metric that a lot of producers use and it's your grain yield divided by your straw yield. And because the grain yield was reduced as well as the straw yield was increased, we saw a significantly reduced harvest index in that perennial crop relative to the fall and the spring crop. 2019 was kind of a crazy year again because it was so wet. We definitely saw reductions in grain yield across the board, significant reductions in grain yield with that perennial. I believe the perennial was producing only about 40 to 30% of like the fall and the spring. However, in those wet conditions, it also produced a prolific amount of biomass. So maybe in a wet year, it's a better crop for grazing or biomass forage production. Interestingly, um, with regards to grain quality, in both years, the green being 2018, the blue being 2019, the perennial grain had higher broach protein content than both the fall and the spring rye and significantly greater higher protein content. So I think with regards to rye, what I've read is around 11% protein content is, is your minimum about, is your average maybe, where we were seeing up to 17% in the perennial rye grain. So once we noticed that the above ground biomass of the perennial was just really prolific. It produced so much biomass. We wanted to compare the perennial grass mix plots, as I mentioned, so those plots that were made for forage, um, to the perennial uh, straw production. So this light purple is forage, and that's the forage harvested from a perennial grass mix plot. The dark purple is the straw from the perennial. Again, y-axis is yield, and 2018 and 2019. Again, significantly greater production of straw than in the perennial crop than the forage crop that is, is designed for forage. Interestingly too, these light purple, the forage is the combination of two harvests. So once in the middle of summer, once at the end of summer, and this perennial forage is just simply from the harvest in the fall. So, really huge potential to produce a lot of biomass in these crops. 
So our research aims to answer some of the questions it's still ongoing um, and a lot of questions still remain in regards to the feasibility and profitability of a perennial grain system. But there's still a lot more questions to answer and, and a lot of the important ones include weed and disease management and you're going to need weed and disease management on a system with one crop on it for multiple years. We also need to still complete our 2020 high crop sampling as I was mentioning to determine the soil physical quality improvements. And personally, I would love to see how a polyculture with perennials would work. And, and this is the idea of really emulating those perennial systems where there's healthy soil, healthy plants, and it's more of a tight system of nutrient cycling, because I don't think the answer is moving from an annual monocrop to a perennial monocrop. Mono, monocrop. So there's still lots more research to be done. So with that, I'll say, are there any questions? And I'll show you my colleague, Kumbi Kim, on a field day last year because it makes me smile. Um, I'll just, here we go. Okay. Thanks, Erin. No problem. Um, that was a great presentation. Um, did anyone, if you do have questions for Erin, the audio quality held up really, really well during that webinar. So if you have any questions, just unmute yourself. Um, and feel free to ask away. Okay, I don't know if we have any questions. So that must mean, oh, does Jill have a question? Jill, just make sure you, um, I'll here, I'll try and unmute you here. Sorry. There we go. All but right. I have a few questions. I've been taking notes through the whole thing. So I think I may have missed some things as you were chatting while I was writing down. So you may have already addressed it. Um, first was um, when you spoke about productivity reduction, it was 2% um, to 1%. So is that due to soil health with the, um, the unsustainable farming practices? Is that, is that what's causing that reduction in productivity? That's part of it. There's also a yield ceiling. Yeah. So like there's only so much fertilizer we can apply to certain crops. And they're not going to give us more because there's there's always constraints, right? So when we had um, we hadn't yet reached our yield ceiling fifty years ago, so there was still lots of uh, crop advances and and fertilizer application that could increase or increase our yields. But we're nearing that point where no amount of fertilizer that we pour onto that crop because of genetic constraints or soil limitations is going to improve our yields. So we need to find a way to be more efficient with the land that we have and we also need to improve the genetics of some of our crops because there's just only so much biomass and grain that some of these crops can produce and we're, we're reaching that ceiling I think. Mm -hmm. Okay and then you've given um, you mentioned something about the, the productivity of the perennials and that you've seen that that is seen to be greater than the annuals. Is that correct? The productivity of the perennials with regards to grain is lower. And that's because there's a couple reasons. Um, some people believe that there will always be a trade-off with maintaining these perennial structures versus your grain yields, because obviously plants can absorb a certain amount of energy from the sun and they can partition that to grain or say roots and biomass. And there's some people that say that is a law of biology. They're not going to be able to, they're always going to see slightly reduced yields because of this. Okay. There's other researchers that are saying they grow for longer so they can absorb more or they can assimilate more photons, more solar energy. And they also um, have a lot more biomass to capture that solar energy. And we have been manipulating things with genetics for many years now. We're getting better at it. So there shouldn't, there's researchers that believe there is no trade-off and we will be able to increase the yields. But because like I said, it's, there's such a new crop. That's, I think that still has yet to be answered. And I'm not sure which side I'm on yet. And if we need to take yield reductions for healthier systems. Mm -hmm. But that's a tough one because mm -hmm. there's lots of hungry people to feed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, another question. So you had said that there's um, that the perennial cereals that they're being developed about 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, 
versus the 11,000 year. Is there any perennial grains that are also ancient that you can use, or is that kind of all been lost through this whole system of? Yeah, I, you know, I, there's not a lot of papers from that time period, but there, I did try to look into like, were there ancient societies that tried to develop perennial grain or perennial crops as opposed to annual? Mm -hmm. And from what I know, from what I've learned, it was abandoned pretty quickly because of the nature of perennials. Like sometimes they don't produce seed for one's whole season. Mm -hmm. And if you're a farmer 11,000 years ago, are you going to choose the crop that gives you way more seed way quicker? Or are you going to be like, Oh, in 11,000 years, we're really going to be in a pickle with our soil health and I'm going to really work on this one. So I think it was, it was abandoned pretty quickly. Yeah. So, so the grains being used now for perennials are all, there's something that's being developed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there, yeah, there's lots of perennial crops out there that do have a seed that we can turn into like a viable grain crop, but it's going to take generations of breeding. Yeah. Okay. And then I have one more question um, about the weed and disease management. And that, I know you said that that's one of the unknowns, but that's something that we do with um, annual crops. Is there any kind of comparison information yet between the two or is that still? Oh, totally. Yeah. And right now the way I'm treating my perennial is similar to an annual when I apply herbicide. The problem is, um, and it's not really a problem. It's that there's not a lot of registered herbicides for these perennial crops yet, because again, they are new. I'm using herbicide registered just for fall rye for my perennial rye. And that seems okay. Um, but what you're going to see, and a lot of the times the way we manage some um, like fungal or disease management is that we rotate crops and that's a really important tool and like um, a toolbox especially for organic producers or even producers trying to minimize their footprint is you rotate a crop instead of spraying the crap out of it with pesticide or fungicide or um, and what happens when you have the same crop year after year on soil is some of these diseases can build up in the soil and mm -hmm. and that's why we rotate crops mm -hmm. one of the arguments against this is that by harboring a much healthier microbial community and a healthier soil it's more resilient to some of these diseases that can build up in your soil that you'd see in an annual system if you didn't rotate your crops mm -hmm. um i didn't i have yet to see a huge disease issue between my cultivars, but also I have seen a weed issue. And one of the ways to deal with weeds is, is tillage. Um, and you can't till a perennial, obviously. So um, you do end up using more herbicide in that, in that aspect. So there's still lots of questions with the management of these in, in terms of weed and disease. Yeah. Okay. I think that was all my questions. Thank you. <laughs> interesting i really enjoyed this oh, awesome yeah it was that was really great erin was there any other questions i just have one question hi yeah, sure. um I, you may have i came in late so maybe you already talked about this but the, the soil carbon levels mm -hmm. um did you see that it was retained more in in your perennial crops than we measured uh, one specific aspect of the soil carbon I mentioned. So we measured what's known as particulate organic matter because we're able to detect those changes on those short-term scales. And we did see that the particulate organic matter in the soils was increasing similar to that of a perennial grass mix compared to our fallow plots with nothing growing on it. So they do have the ability from our research at our one site over the past two years to increase soil particulate organic matter and therefore soil organic carbon, yeah. Um, so then it, then you, it would basically be considered a regenerative um, uh, crop. Uh, yeah. And then, okay, and then the, the second part is how far off is commercialization? It sounds like, you know, with all the herbicides and all that, it could take quite a while to develop the entire There's system. Yeah, there's one commercially available perennial crop right now. It's known as Kernza, um, and that was developed by the Land Institute. 
And so they, that one is commercially available. As far as wheat and rye, and um, I believe there is one variety of rice, but I don't think that's very helpful to you if you are located in Alberta. Um, as far as- That would be helpful. What is really, it? Really, hey? Yeah. Rice? Okay, well, I'll have to get back to you on where that one is sourced from. Um, okay. Again, your, your main contact for the actual varieties of these crops would be the Land Institute. They're sort of spearheading all of the, the genetics and all of the development of these crops. Um, as far as perennial wheat and rye, I can't say how far off they are. I just know, especially with regards to the perennial rye we've been working with, it needs more work still to be economically viable to a producer. Mm -hmm. But the Land Institute for Kernza, as well as the rice, would be would be your main contact. Uh, great. Um, I have looked at them before. And then um, I guess I just thought of one other question that was interesting uh, through the other questions that you had, was the yield. Um, you said that the yield is not as good as annuals, um, but how far of a margin are you talking, like, in terms of percentage? Is it, like, just 2% like off, or is it, like, 50% off? Oh, um, much, much closer to 50% off than an annual. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. 2% would be excellent. No, it's, it's definitely, um, I think in the first year we, it did really well at the Edmonton site. We achieved almost 60% of an annual grain almost. Um, so we were, and then in this year two, we saw reductions in grain and I'm not sure and that's one of those things, was it because of the conditions of last year or was it because we see reduced grain yield after the second harvest? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, if anyone does have questions that come up after, um, after we let everything kind of sink in, um, feel free to contact me through Rural Roots and I can reach out to Erin um, and we can try and get your questions answered. Um, so again, Erin, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you, Jill um, at Resilient Rurals for co-hosting with us today. And I hope everyone has a great day. Okay, thanks so much. If you'd like to learn more about what we can do for your part of rural Alberta, please visit our website at rr2cs.ca.